Did you know that your chances of encountering a Florida black bear are greater today than any time in the past 100 years? Yes, it's true. So it's never been more important for you to know how to share Florida's changing landscape with this amazing animal. Despite historic population declines from human development and unregulated hunting, Florida's black bear population is rebounding across much of the state. We have between 2,500 and 3,000 bears living in Florida in eight different populations. The largest population is over 1,000 bears living in and around Ocala National Forest. These large tracts of heavily forested lands offer a diversity of nut and fruit producing trees and plants. And despite its close proximity to Orlando, the area from the Wakaiba River Basin north to Putnam County provides ideal habitat for bears. Another notable population is located in the Apalachicola National Forest and Tate's Hell State Forest areas located between Tallahassee and Panama City. New DNA sampling techniques using bear hair make it much easier for biologists to generate estimates for black bear numbers in different regions. We set up barbed wire corrals and in the middle of those corrals we have bait. So the bears have a reason to come in and out of those corrals. When they enter, they leave some hair behind and when they exit, they leave some hair behind. And all we have to do is take that hair and analyze it. And just like a person's fingerprint, it's uniquely individual for that bear. And so we can tell how many bears are in the area and the bears none the wiser. Other bear populations are located in the Big Cypress National Preserve Area in Southern Florida the Eglin Air Force Base area east of Pensacola, the Osceola National Forest area west of Jacksonville, and the St. John's River area near St. Augustine. The two smallest bear populations are in the Chesawitzka National Wildlife Refuge area and a portion of Glades and Highlands counties. Both of those areas are highly fragmented and lack the large contiguous tracts of land that bears typically need to avoid the hazards of living in a human-dominated landscape. Uh, the biggest threat to black bears in Florida is, is one of a loss of habitat, just as it is for large mammals wherever they occur. And in Florida, with rapidly growing state with 18 million people, and all those people need, you know, have needs for places to live, work, shop, drive, and we estimate there's only 17 percent of the former range left in the state. And as Florida becomes more and more human dominated the patches of natural habitat become smaller and smaller and the, the risk to bears to access them becomes greater as having to traverse a, a human dominated landscape, roads and come in contact with people increases their risk. Florida black bears are adaptable to a variety of forested habitats. Bears are opportunistic animals. They like a lot of different types of habitat, but mostly it's forest. Uh, primary bear habitat includes bottomland and upland hardwoods, mixed forest, scrub, flatwoods, and swamps. The ideal bear habitat has a mixture of these types that allow bears to access them with different parts of the year and different parts of the seasons. Bears can actually be found almost anywhere in Florida because they wander far and wide in search of food and mates and that includes downtown Orlando in some cases. Florida black bears need large areas to survive. Depending on the quality of available habitat, average home ranges for adult male bears are between 50 and 120 square miles, while home ranges for adult females are usually between 11 and 25 square miles. Contrary to popular belief, Florida black bears eat very little meat. In fact, 80% of a bear's diet in Florida tends to be vegetation. That includes fruits, nuts, berries, and fiber from plants. Um, the other 15% would be from insects, and that's bees, ants, wasps, and beetles. And then really only 5% would be small animals like opossum and armadillo, and also eggs from birds, turtles, or alligators. A bear's diet varies seasonally. However, all year round, salt palmetto is an extremely important element of the bear's diet. They eat the berries, but also the fiber from the plant itself. 
One big difference between Florida black bears and their northern cousins is their winter denning behavior. Even though Florida lies within southerly latitudes, black bears here still den in winter, but for shorter periods of time. Pregnant females must den in winter to give birth to their cubs. They enter dens in December and emerge with an average of two newborn cubs in April. Other females and males only den for brief periods through the winter. Their dens are typically ground nests in dense thickets and under blowdowns or fallen branches. So seasonally, there's less chance of seeing a bear in the winter. Bears' activity schedule is very similar to some other animals. They're called crepuscular, which means they're active most at dawn and dusk. And in the middle of the day and in the middle of the night, they're in relatively inactive. Um, however, this changes seasonally. During the fall, bears can be actively searching for food almost 18 hours a day. Also, we found in Florida that bears that live in the urban wildland interface actually become more nocturnal. And that coincides with a drop in human activity in the areas that they live. Though their population is rebounding, the Florida black bear remains a protected species, both in the eyes of responsible citizens and the law. Everyone might not know this, but a black bear is considered a threatened species in the state of Florida. Uh, therefore, it's illegal to kill them. If someone were to kill a black bear, it is a third degree felony. Uh, that carries a penalty of up to five years in prison and or a $5,000 fine. In addition, if the person is adjudicated guilty, this would be on their criminal record forever. Florida bears are relatively free of life-threatening diseases or parasites, and aside from humans and other bears, they have few natural predators. So despite how big and powerful bears seem, they do still die, and the vast majority of the recorded deaths of bears in Florida is caused by vehicle collisions. Florida black bears need to eat a year's worth of food in eight months in preparation for winter dormancy. And it's the bear's unquenchable appetite that causes problems when living near easy to get human sources of food. Some obvious human food sources include pet and livestock feed. But one not so obvious food is accessible garbage, which bears tear into with relish. The problem is that when people are out in areas where wildlife exists as well, there's a food issue. And when people don't secure the food properly or they offer food to wildlife, it creates conflicts with that wildlife and in this case also with bears. It's much easier for bears to get their calories from rich human food sources, garbage, pet foods and bird feeders, than from natural foods in the wild. That's why the feeding of bears, whether intended or not, is the number one source of human bear conflict. A lot of people wouldn't think about something as simple as placing their garbage out for pickup uh, could possibly be feeding black bears. Now this would be an unintentional act, obviously at first, but if it was determined that this action was becoming an attractant to the bears, therefore they were actually eating the garbage, uh, then that would become an intentional act. So we encourage people to think about these things as well, not just someone who would intentionally be placing out food, say in a dog dish, in their backyard to attract or feed a black bear. Uh, both of these examples would be considered illegal. Feeding a black bear is not only illegal, but it is the wrong thing to do. <coughs> When you see a raccoon in your yard getting into your garbage or bird feed or pet food, you're looking at a gateway species to bear problems. If uh, you have that attractant in your yard and you have bears in the area, you're likely going to have bear problems as well. And the real problem for the bears is that associating food with human beings causes them to lose their fear they become habituated, and the ultimate tragedy here is these bears end up being killed. But the good news is this tragedy is very preventable. The solution to not having problems with bears is securing the food sources, and it, it really is that simple. Be it dumpsters or household garbage or pet food or bird seed, it, if it's secured where bears can't get to it, then we don't have a problem.
As more citizens and agencies become familiar working with FWC on preventing bear conflicts, the more successes they record for communities and the bears. We were having some problems with the bears visiting the park here in Salt Springs. Uh, I called FWC basically because I was concerned for people's safety, uh, not only the residents but the campers that visit the park. Uh, after calling them, they gave us many options. One that seemed to work for us was the bear-proof dumpsters. Once we learned how to operate those properly and make sure that they were locked when they needed to be, it, it has helped quite tremendously. But we feel like this is a great start and it'll be a win-win situation, not only for us and FWC, but for the bears also. Besides using bear-proof garbage containers, FWC also helps educate people about other proven bear deterrents. We learned a long time ago that electric fences are really effective at securing beehives. Now we've expanded that into securing garbage and livestock and any other attractants you think you have in your yard. Here in Florida, it's really turned into a silver bullet for deterring bears. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission manages black bears for their long-term survival and the benefit of people. Protecting enough of the right kind of habitat is the most important thing we can do for bears in Florida. The benefit we, we realize from conserving bears and conserving bear habitat is that bears are known as an umbrella species and we preserve the habitat for bears, we're also preserving the habitat for a myriad number of other species, deer, turkey, songbirds, reptiles, as well as for people to recreate in. So it benefits a large number of species. Recent predictions indicate our state's human population may double in the next 50 years. If that happens, about 7 million acres of land, or about the size of the state of Vermont, could be converted from natural areas to urban uses. As more wild lands are lost to suburban and urban uses, and bears adapt to areas frequented by humans, bear managers must find ways to balance fear with knowledge and acceptance of bears in the landscape. Our wildlife resources are priceless, and in order to keep them for our enjoyment, our children's enjoyment, our grandchildren's enjoyment, we have to learn to tolerate them existing in the same space with us. Here in Florida, one of our biggest challenges with an expanding human population and increasing bear population is we need the partnership with local communities and homeowners associations to not only educate the public, but influence policies so we can responsibly share the land with bears. One of the keys to meeting these challenges is helping citizens, like you, Understand the habits of black bears and what you can do to minimize conflicts with these remarkable animals. The solution is so simple. Just don't intentionally feed bears or unintentionally feed bears by leaving garbage, pet food, or bird seed outside where bears can get to it. But don't stop there. This is an important message. Share it with your family, your friends, your neighbors, your community, so that we can all learn to coexist with bears. To learn more about living and recreating in Florida bear country, go to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's Black Bear website at myfwc.com forward slash bear. Florida's agriculture industry has an overall economic impact estimated at nearly $100 billion annually. While citrus, horticulture, 
fruits and vegetables might be the best known Florida crops. People probably don't know that agriculture in Florida all started with cattle ranching. And that cattle ranching and the impressive and diverse agriculture industry that it spawned would not have been possible without the legendary Cracker Horse. The ancestors of today's Cracker Horses were introduced to Florida by Spanish explorers, beginning with Ponce de Leon in 1521 and continuing well into the next century. Over the next 200 years, however, Spanish settlements were abandoned in the face of British expansion and their livestock was left to roam wild in the harsh Florida wilderness. Hardy and well adapted to the Florida climate and environment, the free-roaming Spanish horse learned to survive and thrive on its own. Feral herds expanded and by the 18th century, thousands of these horses roamed freely throughout Florida. William Bartram, a famous naturalist of the time, described them as the most beautiful and sprightly species of that noble creature that he had ever seen. When Florida's pioneer farm families established ranches across the newly acquired U.S. territory in the early 1800s, they recognized the value of using these wild horses in maintaining their cattle herds. Small and agile, the horses were perfectly suited for moving through the palmettos that covered Florida's landscape. Florida cowboys, nicknamed crackers because of the sound made by their whips cracking in the air, could hunt stray cows where other horses failed. This breed became so essential to working cattle in Florida's rough conditions that it too was given the name Cracker. During the Reconstruction era following the Civil War, a number of Florida ranches began exporting cattle to Cuba, and thousands of Cracker cattle moved through Florida's ports. In one 10-year period beginning in 1868, 1 1.6 million head of cattle were shipped from Florida docks, making the state America's leading exporter. This burgeoning cattle trade became the foundation of Florida's vast agricultural economy. Many of Florida's oldest and largest businesses began as cattle ranching operations during this time, and all depended on the cracker horse. Although best known for their talents at working cattle, cracker horses frequently saw service as buggy horses and work stock. In many instances, they were the only horsepower for family farms well into the 20th century. Yet for all its success, no one realized the breed was on the verge of extinction. During the 1930s, cattle herds suffering in drought-stricken Dust Bowl states were moved to the lush grasslands of Florida. And with them came the devastating screw worm. The arrival of this parasite led to changes in the way Florida ranchers raised cattle. Fencing and dipping vats became commonplace. Ranchers turned to the stronger quarter horse to rope and hold cattle for treatment. The smaller and more agile cracker horse, perfect for herding and driving free roaming cows, was suddenly obsolete. But the cracker horse would not go away without a fight. Over the past 50 years, a few of Florida's ranching families continued to breed cracker horses for their own use. It was their preservation of distinct horse bloodlines that kept the cracker horses from becoming extinct. And from these lines, the cracker horse is making a remarkable comeback. As an extension of its cracker cattle program, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services established herds of cracker horses in Tallahassee and Withlacoochee from some of those pure bloodlines. To adopt breed standards and register foundation stock for preservation herds, the department helped establish the Florida Cracker Horse Association in 1988. Today, along with the Cracker Cattle Association, the department hosts an annual cracker gathering and sale, allowing ranchers interested in preserving the cracker horse to own a piece of Florida's past. The Cracker Horses are living, tangible links to Florida's history, a part of Florida's agricultural heritage, making a place for themselves in Florida's future.
Gardening is a perfect hobby for the Florida lifestyle. A great outdoor activity, it teaches patience, nurturing, and care. But many flowers not native to Florida require more than just a little TLC. Because of concerns over water conservation, as well as the overuse of pesticides and fertilizers, homeowners are taking a look at an attractive alternative, native Florida wildflowers. Woven throughout Florida's abundant natural areas are over 2,800 types of native plants and wildflowers. Each spring they bloom forth to create a stunning mosaic of brilliant color. It was this feast of flowers that greeted Spanish explorer Juan Ponce de Leon in 1513, and having arrived during Pascua Florida, a Spanish term for Easter season, Ponce de Leon named this newly discovered land La Florida. Florida. Today, many Floridians are rediscovering native Florida wildflowers. Through gardens and low input landscapes, gardeners are helping the native plants reach their full potential. Here they tend to be fuller and flower earlier than the same species in the wild. And wildflower gardens take on a new look each year. Because of variations in the weather and the inherent nature of individual species, the colors, textures, and shapes of the plants change from season to season. But these gardens do more than just showcase the beauty of the flowers. Cutting gardens, for instance, provide a free source of flowers for use in arrangements. Aromatic flowers can be used to create fragrance gardens. For homeowners with small plots of land, mini meadows provide an excellent way to add long-term color to your property while reducing mowing to once or twice a year. And homeowners aren't the only ones who benefit from native wildflower gardens. Another type of garden that could be planted is a butterfly garden. When you plant a butterfly garden, you want to put in nectar plants where, where butterflies can come in and get the nectar, or larval plants. Now the importance of the larval plant is it brings in the females who lay their eggs on these larval plants and it provides a source of food for the, the butterfly caterpillars and the female butterflies attract the male butterflies, so you have, a, you have a, a nice diversity of butterflies when you have both nectar plants and larval plants. Before planting a garden, you should plan the garden. Be sure to consider the form, size, color, flowering season, and aggressiveness of the flowers to be planted. Be sure to allow room for plants that spread runners. When selecting a site, consider the plant's moisture needs and light requirements. What is the soil type? Is it wet or dry? Is it in full sun or partial shade? There is a wide selection of native Florida wildflowers available for whatever type of garden you choose to grow. Another critical element when planting your wildflower garden is timing. Almost all wildflowers in Florida tend to germinate in the fall to early winter. For many of the people in the state who've come from other states, spring was the time you planted. Florida, because of its southern exposure and its southern climate, has a very different system. And so most of the plants you would want to plant, even spring, summer, and late fall flowers, you would want to plant in the fall to early winter. Florida has basically three planting zones. For gardeners in the Panhandle and extreme northern Florida, the best time to seed is from very late August to mid-October before the dry weather sets in. It is possible to plant in November or December, but any cold, wet weather could cause the seeds to remain dormant. Moving south, the planting dates can get a bit later, from late September to November in Gainesville and October until December in Orlando. South of Orlando, there's a window of late October to January. A month before seeding, prepare the plot by using a non-selective herbicide or a non-chemical alternative to kill the existing turf. Then, a day or so before seeding, scalp the turf, taking care not to till the area. In Florida, you don't want to till the soil. The reason we don't want to do that is because there are a lot of weed seeds sitting there in that ground ready to go as soon as you give them an opportunity. And by cutting the grass down, 
raking the dead material out. You don't turn that soil over and cause those weed seeds to germinate. Once the clippings have been removed, the ground is prepared. Broadcast the wildflower seed over the area. If you are going to seed by hand, dilute the seed with slightly moistened vermiculite or sand for best results. Then rake or drag the area to get seed to soil contact. Be careful to plant only as deep as the seed is thick. If you have any questions, contact your local county extension agent or a local native plant nursery. If seeds are sown in early fall, then Mother Nature should provide enough water for germination and early growth. If the weather is dry, you'll need to water most days over a two-week period to stimulate germination, watering about a quarter inch each time. After that, wildflower seedlings only need to be watered if they are wilting. Native Florida wildflowers are adapted to the state's nutrient-poor soils and do not need to be fertilized during the first year. In the second year and beyond, a small amount of fertilizer will stimulate flowering and seed production. But fertilizer will also stimulate the growth of unwanted plants and weeds. Weeds should not be a major problem unless the area was tilled first. One way to distinguish wildflower sprouts from young weeds is to plant some of the seed mix in a specific spot in a recognizable pattern. This will help identify which plants can stay and which need to be weeded out. As with any garden, you will need to weed every once in a while, but think of weeding as an opportunity to view your wildflowers up close, find an unusual plant, or see the pollinators that have been attracted to your garden. If grass comes back, Grass herbicides can be used as a spot follow-up, but only after the seedlings are well established. Once they bloom, native Florida wildflowers reward the gardener with brilliant colors and fragrance. But one of their greatest benefits won't be realized until the next growing season. Florida wildflowers have the ability to reseed for the following year. Under natural conditions, after the wildflowers have bloomed, the seeds will ripen and be dispersed by wind and animals. Seeds that germinate in the fall and early winter will grow very slowly until the spring, when the plants will blossom and begin the process again. Once the wildflowers are past their bloom, you may be inclined to cut them back right away. But the key is to be patient. Wildflower seeds need to mature. Wait a month or so before cutting back your wildflowers. By giving seeds time to ripen and be dispersed naturally, you will eliminate the need to reseed for the next season. While a number of states produce and sell native and non-native wildflower seeds for gardeners in the southeast, these seeds may not necessarily grow well in Florida. Many species of native and non-native wildflowers grown from out-of-state seed stock find it difficult to tolerate Florida's heat, humidity, and diseases. While they will bloom, these wildflowers probably will not reseed very well, making annual replanting a costly necessity. The best option for wildflower seeds is native Florida wildflowers produced from Florida seed stock. Such seeds are often referred to as Florida ecotype seeds. When purchasing native wildflower seed, you want to purchase seed that's adapted to our climate, the Florida ecotype seed or using plants that were derived from here in Florida, from natural populations, because these plants are adapted to our conditions, our, our climate, our pests, our diseases, so they've been pre-selected to perform well under our conditions. Florida native ecotype seeds originate from naturally occurring wildflower colonies in Florida. Through centuries of natural selection, these colonies thrive in Florida's climate, Wildflowers from Florida native ecotype seeds not only live and bloom longer, they have a longer period of seed production. Currently, many state and local governments are taking advantage of native Florida wildflowers' ability to reseed. Through roadside and turnpike beautification projects, government agencies have reduced the need for mowing, thus cutting labor and fuel costs. We've been planting wildflowers along our right-of-way for many years now, and since we started using native Florida seed, we've had a significant increase in the successfulness of our program. It helps reduce our maintenance costs, as in we have to mow less times during the year. 
It also reduces the amount of fertilizer and herbicides we have to apply on our right-of-ways and it's less stress on our water supply because we don't have to water the wildflowers. They're adjusted to our native environment. Funding for planting native wildflowers on rights-of-way, parks, and elsewhere in communities come from the sale of the Florida Wildflower Foundation's license plate. Revenue from license plate sales also helps fund education and research projects. The idea of using wildflowers as ornamental plants is not new. In the late 1960s, First Lady Lady Bird Johnson began a beautification project in Washington, D.C. that included the planting of millions of flowers throughout the nation's capital. Her efforts inspired similar programs throughout the country. Landscape architects in communities like Harmony, Florida, are incorporating wildflowers in their designs to reduce water usage by the city and its residents. And by planting wildflowers in rights-of-way and along power lines, utilities and outdoor sign companies are also cutting back on property maintenance costs and reducing mowing cycles. To ensure there is a ready supply of seeds, Florida now has its own native wildflower seed industry. The Wildflower Seed and Plant Growers Association has Florida grown Florida native ecotype wildflower seed for any type of garden you'd like to grow. All those seeds. While growing Florida wildflowers is a great way to preserve and protect Florida's native wildlife, you'll find that you're creating more than just a carefree garden. You're creating peace of mind. There's a certain aesthetic that comes from having wildflowers. For me, it's color, texture, um, you're bringing in butterflies and birds. It's a refuge for small wildlife. Uh, and I think also it just has an overall calming effect on the person who does it. Gardening, having your hands in the soil at times is, can be a very peaceful effect.